Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to kick us off. Firstly, I hope that you and your families are all well. I'm Katie Jacobs from the CIPD, and I've been hosting our coronavirus series of webinars. And this afternoon, we are holding another discussion on the highly complex and challenging area of what a return to the workplace could look like, and specifically on understanding the recently published government return to work guidance. Joining me to discuss this afternoon, Peter Cheese, CEO of the CIPD, Professor Anne Harris, President-elect of the Society for Occupational Medicine, and Andrew Willis, Head of Legal and Advisory at HR Inform, the CIPD's employment law resource. Thank you all so much for joining us today. As ever, I'm just gonna run through some very quick housekeeping. Firstly, a reminder that this session is being recorded. It will be available on demand later today, and you'll find it on the webinar section of the CIPD website. You can also access recordings of all of our previous webinars there and sign up for future sessions. Secondly, if you want to submit questions during the webinar, and I'm sure you've got a lot to ask, we had quite a lot on Monday when we were talking about this, please could I ask you to use the Q&A tab, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat box. Uh, we won't really be monitoring that. Um, we've got a few questions that are left over from the last session, so we'll also try and address those. For legal advice, a reminder that CIPD members can call our HR Inform helpline. It's available 24-7 and you will receive an individual response. And a reminder, we're updating the FAQs and resources on our website all the time as new information becomes available and that you can head to the CIPD Coronavirus Hub for more. And finally, I'm just going to flag our new Wellbeing Hub and Helpline available for members in the UK and Ireland. Together with award-winning workplace wellbeing provider, Health Assured, we're now providing CIPD members with free help and support 24-7, 365 days a year, by a telephone or online consultation with qualified therapists. Members can access the phone number and the online services via the Membership Benefits webpage, and we'll give you some more details about that at the end of the session. So getting on to our topic for this afternoon, for teams of people professionals, we know that return to the workplace is taking up a lot of your time and energy. As I said on the webinar we did on this topic on Monday, working out what a phased approach to return and recovery looks like is proving even more challenging than the original lockdown. Now we know from our recent research that people are anxious about returning to their workplace and about their commute to get there. And we know anecdotally from what we're hearing from people professionals that a huge amount of work and thinking is being done on things like risk assessments, office design, communication. And we know whatever workplace we eventually end up going back to will look and feel radically different to the one that we remember. With more detailed government guidance recently released on Monday evening, if you are paying close attention, we'll be discussing what a safe exit from lockdown could look like for organisations. And we'll also touch on yesterday's confirmation from the Chancellor that the furlough scheme will be continuing to run in some form until October. I'll just quickly take you through our running order. First up, Peter's going to set some context and explain the CIPT's viewpoint and our principles-based approach. Then Anne will take us through the occupational health risks and advice around return to workplace. Andrew will then offer a legal overview of managing return to workplace and he'll also talk about extension to the furlough scheme, uh, what we know so far. Uh, and then we'll get on to questions. Um, and I'm just going to flag that Anne has to leave at quarter to two. So she's going to be disappearing a little bit early. So if you've got any occupational health specific questions, could I ask you please to get them in earlier rather than later so that we have a chance to pick those up. Uh, so that's quite a lot for us to get through. I'm going to hand over to you, Peter, to kick us off. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. And uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. I think we're all getting quite familiar with these sorts of formats. But as Katie said, this is a uh, the next phase and certainly the critical discussion that's happening everywhere now about how and in what ways can we support people beginning to return to workplaces. Um, and it is important to emphasize workplaces. I think a lot of the language has been talking about returning to work and of course many people are working in different circumstances. But um, you know, just to give a few thoughts, I mean, first of all, of course, the government is now very much at this sort of pivot point everywhere between the health crisis and are we beginning to see the flattening of the curve but the economic crisis that's going alongside it and recognizing that the economic crisis is damaging in so many ways and, and therefore a desire to try to open up workplaces which have otherwise had to close 
uh, because the, so many of them require people at work and in, in, in those formal workplaces. But we know the numbers are pretty stratospheric. I mean, if, if you just talk about the furlough scheme, um, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility has estimated that it's 40 billion pounds in the UK economy that it's costing us every three months. Uh, and then on, on the economic side, we've seen also the, the latest uh, estimates for GDP this uh, last quarter dropping 10, 12%. So enormous economic impact. So the balancing of all the variables, and as Katie said, we certainly understand and said right from the beginning that the, the returns to workplaces were going to be more challenging and more complex than the original lockdown. There's a significant shift of responsibility, of course, to the employer now in terms of it assuring that we have safe workplaces in all of the contexts that that's meant under the new guidance. And um, we know that there are many, many different options about how to go back to work. There are so many uh, of the legal constraints and things we have to understand as well. And not least, and, and perhaps most importantly, we have to put our people first. We have to understand their needs and understand their concerns. So uh, just very quickly, we set out some, some guiding principles and certainly some overall guidance that we think hopefully will help uh, clarify some things because there are many, many complexities, as, as I said. And the first uh, thing is, is the work essential? Does it absolutely need to be done from the workplace is, is one of the first questions. Is it work that must be done now? Can it be delayed? Because the more that we can delay in the gradual returns to work, the more that we can learn from it and be able to reassure ourselves as business leaders and, and owners, but also of course our, uh, our workers, that it is safe to return to work. So that's the first question, is it essential? The second is, is it safe? Can we really provide that reassurance in all, all of these forms about the workplaces themselves, but also the travels to work? And that's why I think people have found government guidance really quite challenging. On the one hand, being told to actively encourage people back to workplaces, but on the other hand, being told, yeah, but don't use public transport. And we've seen even today, on the last couple of days, you know, pictures of buses full of people. And, and we have to provide that reassurance. So how do we deal with those? Well, again, the only real way we can do it practically is to do it slowly and gradually, to slowly open up, to, to put in place, the, 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 you know, given the guidance of how you create a safe workplace, to put those in place, put a, have a limited number of people come back and slowly build from that, slowly learn from that. Because the, the harsh reality of so much of this stuff is that it's very practically difficult to make all of this guidance work in every circumstance. So we're talking so much about human behaviors and so many of these social distancing things are not normal human behavior. Um, and, and understanding that and therefore the drift that will naturally happen after a few days or even a few hours of people coming back into workplaces and forgetting these things, you know, using uh, common facilities or brushing past each other or not you know, uh, giving social distance, all those things we know will happen because that is human behavior. So how do we guard for that? Now, on the one hand, of course, government's encouraging us to have all these risk assessments and, and people talking about um, how much these guidances might be actually workable through legal channels. But, uh, but at the very heart of, of these three, the, uh, three ideas, is it essential, is it safe, is, is it mutually agreed? Can we understand that with our workers and our workforces, that we're not forcing them back to work, that we have to understand their constraints, and recognizing incidentally that some of those constraints may be that they want to come back to the workplace because working from home has proved really, really hard. Um, we've still got constraints uh, in, in people returning to workplaces around things like schools not opening. So, so we have to work very closely with our people, put them first, and understand it from a sort of mutually agreed perspective. But as I said, you know, and we'll talk more about this in the call, the legal guidance, the under, underpinning laws that are in, enshrined in the Health and Safety at Work Acts and the, and, the, and the Equality Acts and our employment uh, laws and so forth, absolutely are the foundation that we have to abide by and understand. So finally, you know, that some of these broader ideas of principles there. So if those are the sort of three guiding guidelines, if you will, then some of the principles about you know, putting our people first, about fairness, which is really, really important because it's, there's a danger which we, that we are not inclusive in what we do. We're seeing the emergence of concerns, for example, that people may be in factories where they have to go back to work as they're operating machinery or whatever, that, that might be in the lower skilled, lower paid roles versus the middle managers who are working safely from home. There are things like that we have to think about. We have to be really careful that we're not 
for example, discriminating against people who have less mobility um, uh, to come to work or to work in the workplaces. So, so fairness, really, really important, and inclusion, really, really important. And then openness, transparency, and communication at all times not just within our organizations, but externally. We are going to be held to account, not just by all the legal things, which I hope to heaven don't become the things that uh, dominate, but that we are going to be held to account by how we support our people, how we uh, uh, and communicate with them, and how we are transparent as organizations externally. Because I think to put it in the positive, this is a time for responsible business to stand up, to show that we are doing these things right that we are learning and, and, and implementing things gradually, that we're communicating openly, that we're not abusing furlough schemes or other government funding schemes, and that we are holding ourselves to account on those things and that we're being transparent, because I do believe at the end of the day, again, go back to this point, it, it, we can't end up in mountains of legal cases. It cannot all be policed, so we have to trust each other, trust businesses, trust our colleagues, trust our managers that we're doing the right things. And those to me lie at the very heart of responsible business. And I think ultimately that's going to be one of the biggest things of all that emerges from this, our ability to show that we've acted responsibly, that we are transparent and that we put our people first. So thank you, Katie. I'll, I'll let us uh, move on to Anne. Thank you very much, Peter, for setting the context um, so well there. I'm going to hand over to Anne now. Anne's going to give an overview um, of risk assessment approach. Uh, from an occupational health perspective. So I can see you've unmuted yourself, so I don't have to remind you. <laughs> Off you go, Anne. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be able to give this presentation. Um, SOM, the Society of Occupational Medicine, have produced a very good document to assist and support employers <coughs> in planning the return to work. And that will be available on the SOM website shortly and other materials I've already made available to um, CIPD for their use. Okay, so just going through the general return to work issues. It's really important to use a risk assessment approach with strategies designed to ensure that the workplace, how work is carried out and um, the equipment that is used does not put employees at risk. Be aware of the possible impact on the mental and physical health of your employees. Many of the people who are returning to work in the future in the workplace may well have been completely traumatised by their experiences during this crisis. It could be a result of friends, neighbours, colleagues being very, very sick and some actually dying. So there's all sorts of psychological effects as well as the physical effects of this condition. So plan the, re the return and it's really good that CIPD have put this on the agenda to start with and it requires a multifaceted faceted approach. The SOM toolkit which I referred to will actually be launched from the 18th of May and will be available on the SOM website and that's the link. Next slide please. So just an overview of how the coronavirus spreads. Two modes, first of all droplets. So predominantly that's by coughing or sneezing, could be by singing or shouting. So that's one of the reasons why churches aren't going to be allowed to have um, hymns because that increases the risk of um, transmitting the virus. It requires very careful respiratory hygiene etiquette and safe disposal of tissues within the workplace and at home. It can also spread on surfaces. So if an individual sneezes, droplets will land on surfaces and that could be in the workplace, items such as tables, desks, computer keyboards, telephones. The individual thinks, well, that's fine. I'm okay, I'll go and wash my hands. But if somebody else then comes along and touches that surface, it then spreads onto their hands and they put themselves at risk when they touch their faces, or their eyes or other objects. They put others at risk if they then touch other surfaces. So it's very important to think about regular hand washing and alcohol rubs and having lots of reminders in the workplace. I'm not going to link, click on that link below, but that link is a very good example of how something as simple as coughing and sneezing can be spread to all sorts of other items from mobile phones to surfaces. So hygiene of work surfaces, really important, but I'll leave that for you to watch at your leisure. 
So what about the risks in your workplaces? Well, the first thing to do using a risk assessment approach is think which are the higher risk kinds of organisations. So first of all, thinking about location. Those that are located in very busy conurbations, travel issues are going to be a real issue where social distancing cannot be assured. And there's been discussion today about the number of people who are on um, London buses, how you can maintain social distancing is very, very difficult. High risk organisations are where there's an increased potential for a person to person contact. So thinking about in a workplace where they're doing manual handling, it's very difficult to move an object if you cannot position yourself two metres away, which is the ad advised distance from your partner that's doing the lifting, in which case you might need to come closer at one metre and then you need to think about respiratory protective equipment to make sure that you don't spread the disease between the two of you. Another issue is going to be employees returning to work who have had or do have significant health problems and have been shielding because they're going to be very, very anxious about that return to work. They've been told basically stay in your house, you can't even mix with your family, you can't go out shopping, you have to stay at home, it's so dangerous to go out. And then suddenly we're saying, oh yeah, but come back to work. Obviously that won't be until June time when the shielding is released, but it's going to be a significant F, um, issue for many. Another high risk area is equipment and or work surfaces, which are very difficult to clean. So I know you can't look around your own offices now, but think about your offices. Think about all those soft surfaces. If you've got a desk chair, it's likely to be covered in a nice soft fabric finish. How easy is that going to be to clean? Think about workplaces with poor management strategies. And I would say that the um, HR function, senior management and line managers have, have all got a really important part to play in managing this. And I would even take it as high as the main board. Don't forget the impact of COVID-19 on both the physical and psychological mental health and well-being. So one of the issues that I suspect is going to be really high on the agenda is psychological health when people return. Next slide, please. So we've been talking about the HSC Five Steps to Risk Assessment. You can download a free pamphlet at that website and I'm going to talk you through that process in a second. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so five steps to risk assessment. The very first step is identifying the hazards in your workplace. So we've mentioned about transmission of the virus. We've also thought about moving and handling issues. Think about the, the chemicals. So that's why I've chosen those chemical bottles. There are chemicals in the cleaning fluids. People are going to be washing their hands more. Could lead to issues such as dermatitis. Then after you've identified the hazards, the next step, if you could, thank you, decide who could be harmed and how they might be harmed. So we've identified the hazards, we've thought about the groups of people or the individuals that could be harmed and thinking about how that harm might arise. So from just the perspective of the, of the virus, it's the fact that people are working together, returning to work, thinking about coming in on their journey with public transport and from the minute they walk in through the front door. Next slide, or next button. Once you've decided who could be harmed, you then need to think about evaluating the risks. What's the likelihood of harm happening? And can you put any strategies in place that will reduce that risk? So wearing um, face coverings rather than masks is certainly something that is being recommended by the government on public transport. The reason they're recommending face coverings, so a bit like this, a scarf, and not masks, is that they, the government do not want the supply of masks that's available to the health service to be depleted. And I think that's a very good point to make. Next slide, please. So when you've evaluated the risks, you've thought about the hazards, the people, thought about those risks, you then need to record the, the findings and reflect on them. What are you doing well? What could you do better? And then finally, you review it. 
And you, once you've done the risk assessment, it's a, a living, breathing strategy. So you don't just do it once and for all, you keep reviewing it. What's changed? Have work processes changed? Have different people come into the workplace? Think about the policies that you need. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about this risk assessment approach, and as I say, there is a document that will be available through CIPD, which considers how to do the risk assessment. I would suggest you think about the premises, the people, the work processes, the equipment they use, the policies and procedures that you're going to need and how you're going to communicate those back to the workforce. So the kinds of hazards we might be considering would be, well, obviously, that biological hazard. Secondly, any chemicals that people will come into contact with, whether that be chemicals to clean their work area, chemicals that they might use for general deep cleaning, the use frequently of soap, so you might consider putting some kind of hand moisturiser in the um, toilets. Then there's the ergonomic issues. So although we're getting many people back to work, there will be some people who are continuing to work from home. And the lockdown came around so quickly, it is unlikely that they'll have well-established, well-set-up workplaces at home that comply with things like the display screen equipment regulations. So there may be issues that need to be thought of in that regard. And finally, the psychosocial issues. Lots of things there. People coming back to work who've been furloughed. Some of their colleagues might think, oh, that's, you've had an easy time. We've been working away covering your work and you've been sitting at home enjoying the sunshine and having a furlough salary. So we've thought about the hazards, then we think about the work cycle. So what's being done? How is it being undertaken? And how might the employees be put at risk? So a, a, a simple thing to think about is, have you got a safe system of work? So to identify that, think about some questions. Who, what, where, when, and why? So who are the people involved? Who are doing that work? What are they doing? Where are they doing it? When are they doing it? And why are they doing it? And particularly, why are they doing it in that way? And can we change the way we work post COVID-19? Think also about the implications. Interestingly, that many of us who thought they couldn't work from home have suddenly been able to work from home. And so that might change how people work in the future. Next slide, please. So some important considerations. Social distancing, that's going to be very difficult to keep, ideally, two metres apart, but where necessary, drop that to one metre with appropriate protection in. But thinking about how do people get up and down within a building, within a lift? My previous workplace was, I was on the seventh floor. I cannot imagine walking up seven flights of stairs and being in a fit state to work when I get on top of it. Very good for my physical health, um, but perhaps not my mental health. How would I get into a lift that's normally crammed jammed to, to full capacity? Thinking about perhaps one of the things we've mentioned in the tool is to think about how people can use staircases or use corridors, have one way corridors so that you don't come face to face with somebody else. How you manage work. What mental and physical health support is there available? And an occupational health service is very, very important. Many places have in-house uh, OH services, others buy in support. But I can foresee that the psychological health of people returning to work is going to be a significant issue. Think about making provision for work, uh, for people at work who may be taken ill. Think about how you brief your first aiders in appropriate mechanisms for delivering first aid. Think about what protection they need. Think about policy development. They will all have been taught on their first aid course how to do CPR. You know, they're bouncing up and down on somebody's chest and doing mouth to mouth. That's totally inappropriate now. How are you going to manage that? There is some information on the St John's website whereby you cover the casualty's face with a, a cloth and then you do just chest compressions. What they've not thought about is in a workplace having availability of um, masks and gloves for each first aider. So provide them with a little pack with equipment that will protect them if they have to do something such as CPR. 
So social distancing is an important consideration. Hygiene is a, an important consideration. Work management, mental and physical health support, and making that provision for the first aiders. Next slide, please. An example of a COVID-19 safety plan is available on that link at the bottom. It's actually come from a New Zealand website, the equivalent of the health and safety executive. You have to search a little bit. So go to that link, have a look down and you'll find a template for developing a safety plan. I think it's a really good tool to get you thinking about how you can protect your staff when they come back to work because of course this does need some planning. Next slide. So these are some additional government resources. They do change on almost a daily basis as to which are available and which aren't and some that were available last week have been taken down but I did check these yesterday. So protecting health and maintaining productivity there's a very good resource from the government, which is guidance for employers and businesses. Guidance for specific sectors is at the next link. Health and safety executive, very useful resource. Go to that link. Many of you will have vulnerable workers. So government guidance on protecting the most vulnerable and particularly those who have been shielding is available at the next link. So in short, way to go forward is to be effective in undertaking your risk assessments and planning this before people even get as far as thinking about coming through the front door of your organisation. And that's me. Thank you so much Anne. Um, just before I hand over to Andrew I'll just pick up on a, a few things I see some stuff going on in the in the chat. So Anne mentioned a lot of resources there and we'll make those all available to you. The slides will be available to download so you'll be able to use those links from this afternoon and we'll also share some of the other stuff that she mentioned. Um, also some people asking about risk assessment templates, uh, that's something that we are working on at the moment and we'll have those out as soon as possible for CIPD members. Um, so I'll hand over to Andrew now to give a bit of legal overview. Thanks Andrew. Thanks Katie. Hello everybody. Um, the first slide if we can just move on uh, to that just picks up um, on the extension of the furlough scheme, which was obviously announced by the Chancellor yesterday. So um, it's now been confirmed that the scheme will continue in its current form until the end of July and will then actually go on for a further three months until the end of October. But from the 1st of August, there'll be a greater element of flexibility, um, which will allow firms to bring staff back to work. However, uh, the other side of that is employers will need to start sharing with the government the costs of paying salaries. So I think it's good news that the scheme has been extended. Uh, it takes us away from that cliff edge that we were approaching at the end of this week when collective consultation may have uh, had to start. Um, but we do await further details on exactly how the scheme will look and how it will work from 1st of August onwards. But for now, um, no immediate need to consider redundancies, although obviously given that the scheme changes from August 1st, we'll need to start thinking about that pretty soon if we haven't already. Um, so that's not the main focus of the presentation today, but I think it's important just to bear in mind that change because that partly sets the context in which this return to work is happening. So next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of guidance as to how the return to work should look and operate, the first guidance that was issued came out um, on Monday on the back of uh, Boris Johnson's broadcast on Sunday evening. And obviously the uh, guidance disting distinguishes between three steps in time, the first one beginning today. So we're now in step one and there's a very brief section on the workplace and work um, in that 50 page document. But what, is what it does say is that for the foreseeable future, wherever possible, workers should continue to work from home. So that remains the focus where it's possible. If people are working from home successfully, they should continue to do so rather than travel to their normal physical work 50 page document. Um, sectors of the economy that uh, should now be open include food production, construction, manufacturing. Um, the only exceptions really are those workplaces like those in the hospitality industry and non-essential retail, which the government still requires to remain closed during step one. 
But other than that, the expectation is that workplaces should open for people who cannot work from home. It's not clear uh, from the guidance what happens uh, regarding those people who cannot work from home, perhaps because they've got IT issues. Um, I'm certainly aware of one or two cases where, although um, a group of workers have by and large been asked to work from home, one or two of them haven't been able to because they haven't been able to get the IT set up right to allow them to connect to company systems and the like. And they have been furloughed. Um, question now, could they be required to return to work under this guidance? Not clear whether this is a sector by sector approach or whether anybody who can't work from home for any reason can be asked to return to the workplace. Uh, my guess would be the latter probably applies, subject to uh, a safe environment uh, being a practical uh, possibility uh, for those people. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to the COVID-19 secure guidance that uh, was issued, I think it was issued yesterday, although the days tend to flow into one another at the moment. There's lots of lots of guidance uh, coming out day by day, as Anne, as Anne mentioned in uh, in her presentation. So there are five key points that are highlighted by the government uh, in these guidelines, in these basically health and safety guidelines. And again, the first point made is that employees should continue to work from home if they can. And for those workers that, who are returning, number two, employers should carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment, again, which Anne has touched on already in her presentation. Importantly, they have to do that in consultation with workers or trade unions. So it's not something imposed on the workforce. It's something really you should be consulting with workers on. Um, everybody has a responsibility under the Health and Safety at Work Act, employers and employees alike. And the uh, duty to consult, um, well, with recognised trade unions, uh, it's uh, an obligation that's been in place for many, many years. But even if there isn't a recognised uh, union in the workplace, there is an obligation to consult either with workers directly or with representatives chosen by them. And that's under, under legislation dated from 1996. So again, a, lang a long-standing obligation to consult with the workforce on uh, health and safety measures. It's also mentioned in the guidance that uh, employers should publish the results of their risk assessments on their website and it's an expectation that businesses with over 50 employees will do this. So it probably doesn't amount to a legal obligation as yet, but certainly the guidance suggests that uh, it's expected that organisations will share their risk assessments online if they are large enough, if they have over 50 employees. Third point, where possible, employers should maintain two metre social distancing in the workplace. Um, and ways to achieve this include redesigning workspaces, uh, staggering start times, as Anne mentioned, creating one-way walkthroughs, perhaps opening more entrances to and exits from the building if that's possible, changing layouts of seats, seating and the like. Um, so that's all with a view to trying to maintain two metre social distancing. Where that isn't possible though, point four, says you have to make attempts to manage the transmission risk. Um, and that's by doing things like putting barriers, perhaps perspex barriers in shared spaces, uh, creating shift patterns again, or fixing teams as opposed to rotating them so that people don't have contact with too many people during the course of the day, doing what you can to make sure that colleagues face away from each other rather than face each other uh, when working. And then last, but obviously importantly, um, cleaning is very, very important and the, the cleaning process should be reinforced as much as possible. So that's more frequent cleaning, um, close attention to objects like door handles and keyboards, hand washing facilities or hand sanitizers at entry and exit points, perhaps even provision of those facilities around the building along with receptacles for dirty handkerchiefs and the like to prevent people having to walk too far uh, to wash their hands or to dispose of handkerchiefs. So 
that's uh, the five key points uh, outlining in the guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. And this one just outlines the eight sector specific guides that have also been published. Um, and doubtless uh, you will probably have already had a look at the one that applies to your workplace. One question that's come up a lot um, in, the, in the course of the last few days is what employers can do about uh, health tests or temperature checks for employees and concerns around whether that's possible, whether that requires consent. Um, certainly, there's a primary um, focus on maintaining safety in the workplace, and that's a duty shared by employers and employees. And clearly, being assured as to somebody's uh, health status can and should probably form part of that. But there are issues around temperature checks and more general um, health checks. Um, primarily, the employer would need consent to either carry out an, a medical exam or ask health related questions, or even just take a temperature on entry to the building, because a temperature check would qualify as a medical examination and would, and would really require consent. In terms of temperature checks, you query their usefulness anyway, given that um, people who present with COVID symptoms seem to present with a range that don't always include a high temperature or even uh, a cough. Sometimes it can be shortness of breath, uh, repeated and severe headaches. So a temperature check in itself probably wouldn't catch everybody, but if you do carry them out, they are medical examinations and then therefore almost certainly require uh, the consent of the employees. Um, <clears throat> doing that, either carrying out checks on temperature or asking more wide ranging questions do carry risks. And it's important to be aware of those. Number one, around data protection. And uh, number two, around possible claims of constructive dismissal, although you would expect most employees to understand the need for, and indeed support health checking to help to keep everybody safe. A little bit more on data protection. <clears throat> health information is what's known as special category personal data. So it may only be processed for one of a number of specified grounds, and that does include for health purposes, um, but consent or agreement is necessary. The only um, exemption really uh, would be for a, an occupational health professional to process that kind of data where it was necessary for a, one of a number of specified health reasons. And <clears throat> data protection is a presentation, a webinar in itself. So not to go into too much detail here, but just be aware that if you haven't got a dedicated occupational health professional carrying out uh, these checks <clears throat> and you would certainly need consent of employees to carry them out and just be aware of those risks and take more advice if that's something that you're planning to do. <clears throat> just a thought occurs to me in terms of a practical solution rather than carry out checks or ask questions and store uh, information relating to individual employees um, why not just ask questions of employees um, <clears throat> publicize the information that they need to be aware of, the symptoms they need to be alive to, uh, ask them to seek advice if they experience any of them. <clears throat> perhaps if it's a small workplace, perhaps it's even worth just asking on entry to the workplace each day <clears throat> whether or not they're experiencing any of these symptoms. Um, that saves drawing the information to save some of those data protection issues um, arising. Uh, that's obviously not always practical, certainly in a larger workplace, but something to bear in mind for smaller workplaces. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just have to take a quick drink. Okay, so managing return to work. So if we've dealt with some of the safety issues that arise um, in the last two slides, these are some of the employment related, HR related issues that may arise. And really, first off, I would recommend contact, clarity and consistency when dealing with this issue with employees. So ideally, if possible, 
Line managers should try and discuss a return to work with each employee one to one before it happens. This would provide the employee with an opportunity to raise issues of particular concern to them, perhaps their individual circumstances, <clears throat> what makes them nervous about returning, but it also gives the employer a chance to set expectations for the return. <clears throat> if a conversation isn't possible, then a written communication at least is advisable. Again, inviting queries from the employee and setting out expectations. And then following the return to work, um, do adopt a consistent approach to managing COVID related issues. And in the, in the last two slides, we'll, we'll look at why that's important. So next slide, please. In fact, then we're on the final slide now. So this looks at management of employee relations issues in the workplace and really on the back of this crisis and this situation, you can probably be expected to be dealing with a lot of situations around both ends of the spectrum. That is employers who are very reluctant to return or nervous about returning to the workplace. <clears throat> and perhaps one or two who are more blase about the risk and perhaps who are non-compliant with workplace rules. How do you manage and deal with those? Well, I think contact uh, with people, explanation, clarity, and consistency are all important elements of dealing with both sets of employees. Firstly, nervous employees, in other words, those who are reluctant to re return to the workplace. <clears throat> I think in the, in the context of what we've just heard about the furlough scheme, do ask the question whether they can be placed <clears throat> or remain on furlough, because that may delay the issue and things may look a lot different in three, four, three, four weeks time, who knows. Secondly, ask whether the employee can work from home. Do they have particular circumstances, whether it be their own health conditions or their family circumstances, which means that they are at particular risk or have particular issues? Could they carry on working from home as a way of addressing those? And even if that isn't possible, could concerns be addressed <coughs> by, again, different start times or workplace alterations or the like? <coughs> Excuse me, try throw. <clears throat> so what happens if somebody refuses to work um, and if their situation isn't covered by current guidance such that they might consider working from home? Well, ultimately, um, consequences might include the withholding of pay or even disciplinary action in the case of uh, employers who are simply refusing to come back when there doesn't seem to be any particular reason that's specific to them preventing that. But bear in mind a number of risks around that. Firstly, the discrimination risk. <clears throat> There's a duty to make reasonable adjustments in the context of disability, and many of these employees may well have a disability. So think about that risk. Think about the general unfair dismissal risk. So in the context of unfair dismissal, the first test the employee or the main test the employer must pass is acting fairly and reasonably and in the context of the current crisis and the anxiety it's causing to individuals um, it's understandable why many people will be reluctant to come back to work um, and you've got to show understanding of that of that situation and empathize with employers and do as much as you can uh, to meet those concerns Bear in mind also the risk of an automatically unfair dismissal claim. Um, where an employee believes they're in serious and imminent danger, <clears throat> which might well be the case if um, uh, resources haven't been devoted to maintaining a safe environment or if the uh, uh, provisions ha are not being observed in the workplace, that may be a, um, a relevant factor. Simply raising a safety concern can lead to a claim of automatic unfair dismissal <clears throat> and um, a disclosure that they may have felt at risk may that bring them within whistleblowing protection. So before you take any kind of action, especially dismissal, take advice, think carefully about the situation and always make that the last step on a long list of potential actions, starting with alternatives to working. Uh, and moving through adjustments you might make in the workplace. 
In terms of employees who are non-compliant, again, ensure that your workplace rules are clear, broadcast, published to everybody, that everyone understands them and everyone understands the consequences of not complying with them and apply those rules consistently. Heaven forbid you may find yourself in the situation of having to dismiss somebody who flouts rules on a consistent basis. And in defending a tribunal case from fair dismissal, what, you, what, what I would want to uh, be able to point to is clear rules that everyone understood and, and also a clear understanding on the part of everybody of what the consequences would be if those rules weren't followed. So deal with employees in a consistent way, make sure everyone understands what they're supposed to be doing. And I think I got through that, Katie. Sorry about the coughing uh, there. Um, uh, well, you but, know, you're, um, allowed, you're not allowed to cough anymore. I'm no. Um, <laughs> in today's environment. Exactly um, right, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry that Anne's had to go. She's doing back to back webinars today. So, obviously, this is an incredibly hot topic. I see she's been um, really kindly answering some QAs in the QA box. Um, I will read some of those out um, in our last kind of 10 15 minutes, um, but you can also read those yourself as well. Um, Peter, do you want to unmute yourself um, and get on to questions, most of which are, are, have quite a strong legal angle? So, um, Andrew, a couple of people have asked about um, what if employees can't return to work because of childcare issues? What should the employer do in those cases? Well, again, I think it's a case of looking at possible alternatives. Is it possible for them to, to return uh, to work uh, from home? Um, if that isn't possible, I checked the furlough guidance again this morning. And it hasn't changed in the sense that it's still advised that you can furlough people with both caring responsibilities and uh, with health concerns, subject to there being some effect on your business um, of the coronavirus. So that is an option as well. Um, ultimately, if those options run out, then a period of unpaid leave might be uh, the only option if somebody truly can't return to work. Uh, but as always, look at all of the options first. Thank you. Um, there was a question, and we had this on Monday as well, about working from home looking like it's going to become a longer term arrangement for a lot of people. Um, is there any guidance on equipment provision for employees working from home and the best way to approach this? And before I throw this over, I'll just read out Anne's answer. Um, she says that computer use is likely to be an issue. We have to consider the display screen equipment regs and the requirement of risk assessments and um, she flags that HSE have a uh, information on their website and there's a useful downloadable risk assessment form available there um, but Peter in terms of people working from home for the longer term what advice mm. would you offer in managing that? Yeah I think um, there are several points here one is that I think we can all see through this um, you know, epidemic that we have adapted in many ways to very different forms of working and so so many organizations talking about so how do I take the benefits of that forward for individuals as well as you know, more broadly the organization? So this idea is sort of blended working where you know, people have more option, option and opportunity to work for some of their time from home and some of their time perhaps in the workplace. But you know, as, you, as you said, Katie, there, there are of course implications in terms of our duty of responsibility and care to people working from home, the physical uh, well-being and all this sort of workstation ergonomic stuff. And we know and it's very easy to forget this that so many people are working from home don't have dedicated workspaces. They're literally almost sometimes working off their beds and other environments like that, which are not long term conducive to any kind of safety or well being. So, so that it does raise those questions. And, and I, I noted you, you thought it as well, um, Katie, that Twitter had said that they expected this to be a permanent state of affairs for people working from home. And indeed, maybe it will. But I think the reality is what we're going to see is far more of this flexibility across people who you know, actively choose and want to work from home, perhaps full time, people who want some combination of work from working places and, and home, and some who, as we've been exploring during the course of the call, probably do still need to work from uh, workplaces, but even then, how can you make that more flexible? So it does, as you said, it raises these other questions about you know, how do we understand the holistic working environment in which people are working, wherever they're working, and our duty of care and our responsibility to ensure that those, those places are safe. And to come into the sort of coronavirus stuff, we know, interestingly, working from home was our, our option. That was the, the lockdown. So as employers, you say, right, you're working from home. So your obligation is to keep yourself safe and, and abide by all these rules and social distancing. 
but we still have that responsibility to ensure that what they are doing and how they're working is conducive to their health and as safe as it possibly can be. So yeah, they're important questions. Thank you. Um, Andrew, if an employee unwillingly comes back to work and then gets sick with COVID from the workplace, would they be able to sue the workplace? I guess you can't prove where they caught it. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, potentially, um, that's a possibility. Certainly, if there was an unsafe workplace and um, the employee could establish on balance a causal link between that and them developing the infection, then in principle, uh, certainly they could bring a personal injury claim as they could for any other injury or illness caused at work. Uh, their difficulty would be, as you say, establishing a causal link because obviously you can catch this virus anywhere. But, you know, it may be possible in some cases to uh, establish that link and where it is in principle, a claim would be possible. Yeah, I think one, one of the intriguing things that arises from this is, uh, well, it seems to have gone a bit quiet <clears throat> from the sort of government consultations or, or press uh, statements that the test, track and trace idea, which is, is arguably a, a next step, because all this social distancing thing, all the challenges we've talked about around really keeping everybody safe in all circumstances, with that as your only really recourse, you know, are we going to see more of the test, track and trace ideas? I mean, we've seen the emergence of that in other countries. There are many apps becoming available and employers beginning to encourage people to use those kinds of apps as another means of, of reassuring for safety. But then that brings other implications, doesn't it, Andrew? I mean, first of all, this key point about could I prove where I might have got the coronavirus from? Well, if I've got track and trace, it becomes a lot easier to show that. Secondly, uh, and I think we're going to have to confront this issue too, is, is the whole question of confident, confidentiality and privacy. Because, you know, if I've got things that are tracking where I'm going and whom I'm in connection with, it, does that become a data protection right and an issue of privacy? Um, and of course, where employers are asking for more information about people's potential exposure or, or other aspects of their health in terms of their ability to come back to work, for example, those questions become more and more central. So I, I think we're, we're still on a journey where we're talking so much now about these protection things and social distancing that I think some of the medium term solutions which have been talked about but seem to have gone a bit quiet at test, track and trace are clearly going to be, become part of the landscape as well and will raise other questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure the, um, the pilot's going particularly well as regards the, the uh, NHS developed app, but I think the data protection issue, issues that arise in the context of that are are for the authorities because they're the ones storing the data but obviously data protection arises in the workplace in the context of health checks recording yeah. health information and that sort of thing so very much something to be alive to um, um, because obviously there are particular issues around storing health information uh, which is spe special category data and uh, and is therefore particularly protected under the legislation mm -hmm. thank you um, got a question, if come October it's still not safe for a vulnerable person to return to work and we can't pay for the leave, then what are our next steps? Redundancy? Um, so I guess uh, Anne just put a point on there, which I think would probably be our point as well, Peter, to kind of get those people to, if you can, continue to work from home or consider redeployment to a home-based role. But if that's not possible, Andrew, then what, what are the options? Well, I think ultimately, if it, if it were necessary to terminate employment, if there's no other option, it would be a capability dismissal because it wouldn't really qualify under the definition of redundancy because you would still need someone to do that job. So you'd still need the same resources in place to carry out the work, albeit that particular person uh, wouldn't be able to carry out the work for their own health related reasons. So it definitely wouldn't be redundancy and it would be, it would, it would be risky and dangerous to go down that road. But I think you, you could treat it as a capability dismissal situation if you had exhausted all of the possibilities. Okay. Um, and a very quick um, operational one, um, Andrew, you mentioned that people are expected to put risk assessments on their website. What if you're an employer that doesn't have a website? Do you publish them internally on like shared notice boards and things like that? There's no requirement set out in the guidance for that. So I, I, think, I think the wording is if, if possible. So I think, I think it's recognised that not every business will have a, a website. So if they haven't got one, obviously they can't post it. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, yeah no, I think as, as I said, I think we, we would want to encourage people to be as transparent and open on all these things as possible. Because as I said, there are huge issues of trust uh, on all of this. We've got to reassure our employees. We've got to reassure wider stakeholders, people who might be visiting our business and all sorts. So 
So I think we have to be more trans as transparent as we possibly can be. And I think this is going to play into the wider scrutiny that we can all expect. And, and I don't know if you've got thoughts on this, Andrew, but when the government was saying earlier, I think yesterday even about, say, the HSE coming in and inspecting all the workplaces, well, the resources don't exist to do that. And I don't know how we'd ever do it. Um, and how would you test every single circumstance? So again, the, the, the need for us to be open and transparent to try to provide those reassurances and to act responsibly, I think will be at the centre of the response to all of this. Um, we've had a question, and this has come up a lot, about um, people not wanting to travel on public transport, and that being, is that deemed as a reasonable reason for not returning and continuing to work from home? Um, if you think that the workplace can be made safe, but it's the getting there that's the issue. Well, again, I think I think stri <clears throat> strictly um, how someone gets to work is a matter for them. So, as a matter of law, if they couldn't re if they couldn't report to work, um, you go through all the steps we've already talked about. And ultimately, if somebody cannot be at work, and at the very least, ultimately, you might be looking at a period of unpaid leave. But as with everything else connected with this situation, it's unprecedented, and it's also causing a huge amount of anxiety for people. So I think it's incumbent on employers to be as understanding and accommodating as they can be and think about all of those alternatives uh, that we've talked about as a way of uh, dealing with those concerns. Yeah, and I think in, in, in even the short term, but in the longer term, this is causing a lot of reappraisal of, of, of things like staggering work schedules. So we then all have to be there nine to five so that we can spread the load and we can reduce the exposure in those ways in terms of any use of public transport. I mean, public transport itself would be asking that because they can't cope uh, with, the, uh, with the, the guidelines as we have them. But I think longer term also, it's more and more this debate about uh, what a modern office or workplace will really look like. And it may be quite different. It may be much more sort of hub and lots of spokes and, and more localized offices for larger organizations where people can come together in much smaller groups and then they're using technology to connect in very different ways. And people, you know, certainly uh, many employers we're talking to are all actively looking at those sorts of strategies for longer term because I think we're all recognising, and it's pretty clear when you, you hear the government talking about extending further into October and so forth, there's going to be many, many months, and it may even be many years, um, before we really get on top of this in ways that would, if we did want to go back to sort of big formal offices and things of that nature, that we can really do it. Um, so certainly for office work, I think we're seeing more and more people just talking about these different ways of localizing work, smaller hub and spoke type um, facilities, and, and therefore not requiring people to travel so much, and certainly more flexible working schedules. And I think those may be some of the longer lasting outcomes of, of this crisis. Thank you. Um, before I close, just one point on that to you, Andrew. Um, somebody asked in our previous webinar on, we, on this, and we didn't get to it, if you are doing what Peter says and staggering work times, and that, does that involve having to make changes to people's contracts, and do you need to mm. then consult for it? You would. Um, it, it, it does involve, in most cases, a change to the contract. Most contracts are not as flexible as to allow uh, dramatic changes in shift time, so it would be something you need to do by agreement. And, you know, if you're talking about 20 or more, um, employees, we normally recommend that you consult collectively purely because the ultimate uh, solution to a problem like that for employees, uh, for employers, if they can't secure agreement, is to dismiss and re engage. It's a high risk thing to do, but sometimes it's the only, only option left, and that necessitates consultation. So, normally the advice is to collectively consult when you're planning changes like that, just in case you end up in the position of having to impose that change by dismissal and re engagement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to close it there because I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this afternoon. Thanks, Andrew and Peter, and uh, retrospectively to Anne, if she ever watches this. Thank you, Anne, for being so fabulous. Um, a reminder, the webinar and the slides will be available on demand from this afternoon, um, and all of the resources that Anne mentioned will um, try and get out to you as well, um, including the toolkit from SOM, which I think is out on Monday. Um, feel free to download all, the, all of those, share them with your peers and colleagues. And um, we had quite a lot of questions in about the um, changes to the furlough scheme. I think we're still waiting for further guidance around that. I'm sure we will be doing an upcoming webinar on, uh, on what all that means and kind of what the next steps around extension of furlough or the flexibility to the scheme are. So do watch out for that. Uh, you can sign up for future webinars via our website. Uh, and a quick plug, if one webinar in a day isn't enough for you, Peter and I are going to be back at half past three to do a special leadership webinar uh, we're going to be discussing the longer term impact of the coronavirus on the people profession, leadership and the future of work with government CPO Rupert McNeil. 
And a final, final reminder about our new wellbeing support for members in the UK and Ireland with a free 24 seven telephone helpline staffed by therapists and provided by Health Assured. So thanks very much for watching and we will see you next time.